Hey everyone, Tom and Dan here to talk about Bone Frog Coffee. Tim Cruikshank is a retired U.S. Navy SEAL who's defended this nation around the world during the most dangerous of times. When Tim retired after 25 years, he wanted to get back to the very community he served. So Tim founded and developed Bone Frog Coffee Company for the specific reason to assist the Naval Special Warfare Community and the families of Navy SEALs by giving back 10% of all the proceeds that Bone Frog Coffee brings in. You know, during my day, and especially when we do the show, I drink Bone Frog Coffee. It's all that I drink. I really love the Zen Frog decaf. Bone Frog has incredible sample packs, the perfect way to try all the amazing Bone Frog blends. Sample packs are four ounce samples of all six blends. And when you use our exclusive promo code Gold Shields, you get an additional 10% off individual orders and 15% off a subscription order. They have an iconic roaster, Dave Stewart, who has for 50 years developed a mastership of roasting and he helps create their blends. He mentors and he roasts coffee for Bone Frog. They source their beans from the best fields in the world of Central and South America. So make sure you go to bonefrogcoffee.com slash gold shields and use our promo code gold shields. Look for their new blend, Red, White, and Brew, their sample packs. You can order whole beans or ground, whichever you like, and K-Cups. Make sure you get four bags for the entire month of coffees for one flat shipping rate. And not to mention their incredible merchandise of T-shirts, polos, coffee mugs, shot glasses, and their great hats. So go right now to bonefrogcoffee.com slash gold shields and get 10% off your first order and also 15% off your Bone Frog Coffee subscription. Just enter gold shields at checkout. That's bonefrogcoffee.com slash gold shields. Hey, welcome back to Gold Shields. This is Dan Murphy along with my partner in crime, Tom Smith, every week bringing you the best true crime stories directly from the experts, detectives, and investigators who made those cases and who know the most about them. Today is no exception. We're going to be featuring what is potentially and probably the most famous cold case serial killer in the history of criminal justice. Tom, who do we have this morning? We're very lucky to have this gentleman. We're thrilled, and, and we've waited for this. I, I first talked to Richard Jones, I think, in July and asked him a favor to hold off on this show for Halloween because we're going to talk about a case that is one of the most famous and maybe first serial killers out there, Jack the Ripper. And 135 years later, we still talk about him. It's incredible to think about that. You know, he's still spoken in so many avenues of, of society around the world when something happens. Oh, it's Jack the Ripper. Oh, is it Jack the Ripper? The term is synonymous with, with true crime and actually, like you said, a cold case. And we have and thrilled to have the one of the leading experts in Jack the Ripper from London, England, uh, that we are so proud and happy to have Richard Jones. Richard, welcome to Gold Shields, and thank you very yes. much for being here today. Hello from England. Uh, what an introduction as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, you deserve it. You have, uh, have certainly earned it. And this is, as we no said, pressure there. Uh, possibly one of the most famous cases ever. It's certainly one of the most intriguing because it is unsolved but also the nature of the crimes. There's so many theories about who this individual was and how many homicides he did or didn't do or did he act alone and stuff. But today we're going to get the real story as much as possible from the expert. Uh, Richard, how did you come to become an expert in the Jack the Ripper? Tell us a little bit about your background. What led to this? Well, it's a, it a very bizarre background, actually. My, my, my way into it wasn't, uh, wasn't a sort of traditional routine. It was, came through Charles Dickens, to be honest, uh -huh. who uh, has always been a passion of mine. I've always liked Charles Dickens' novels. And in 1979, I was working as a postman in London. And I, I, I was walking around London doing my round, and I just saw all these places. And I thought, yeah, they're quite familiar. And they're places I'd read about in Dickens as a child. So I started offering tours in 1982 
around Dickens London and the ghosts of London. And people kept saying to me, do you do anything about Jack the Ripper? You know, I've heard a lot about Jack the Ripper. Do you do anything about Jack the Ripper? And I knew nothing about Jack the Ripper apart from what I'd seen in a few films. So I started looking into it and I thought, do you know, this is a really good story. It's got everything. It's got uh, it, it's got history. It's got criminology. It's got pl a police force. It's a great detective story, but it's also a social story as well. And that's what got me really into it. And since then, I'm, I, hardly a day goes by when I'm not studying some aspect of the Jack the Ripper case. And even now, 42 years later. It's amazing. Uh, and like I said, the the intrigue of it and, and just to give you a little background we, we were down in in crime con down in florida uh a couple of months ago and we would talk to people and you know they say hey what what do you have coming up on the show and we mentioned this show the response to this particular show people can't talk about can't wait for because it's so intriguing and everyone knows it you know everyone's familiar with the term with the name you know, maybe not the particulars of the crime, but everyone knows Jack the Ripper. I actually just got a phone call earlier from a very good friend of ours asking me, is the show today? <laughs> I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes, we're doing it today. Jack the Ripper's today. So it, it just consumes people. And it's intriguing to hear how it, how it got into your life. So, hey, let's dive into it. Let's, let's go with this. Uh, tell us about the story of Jack the Ripper, the beginnings, the investigation, which is mind blowing how things of today were started with this investigation that you were explaining to me, which is fascinating, but let's get into it. Let's get into Jack the Ripper. Okay. Well, the Jack the Ripper murders happened in 1888. Uh, as far as we know, I'll come to that again in a few moments time, but the main murders happened in 1888. And they started on August the 31st with the murder of a lady called Mary Nichols. And then a week later, another lady called Annie Chapman was murdered. Now, what you can see here is the, the murderer is progressing. So with Annie, with, sorry, with Mary, with Mary Nichols, the first thing that happens is that uh, she's disemboweled. Uh, her throat's cut. She's disemboweled. A week later, Annie Chapman's murdered. This time, the killer takes a trophy of his kill. And that is he takes out Annie Chapman's womb and goes off with that. And that's on the 8th of September, 1888. Then there's a gap. For some reason, uh, the, the progression doesn't continue until the end of the month. What probably happened was that there was a lot of anti-Semitism going on at the time. And you had a huge number of immigrants coming into the East End of London. And they got blamed for the murders because nobody had seen any crimes like this. So they put two and two together and made seven. And thought, well, it's a new type of crime. Never happened before. Can't be an Englishman doing it, don't you know? It's got to be one of the immigrants. So anti-Semitism started up in the area. And this then led the police to flood the area with police officers, not so much to catch the killer, but to try and control what was going on in the area. And that seems to have deterred the killer. So by the end of the month, everyone thought, oh, it's, it's happened, it's finished, it's gone. But then on the 30th of September, we had the night of the double murder. And that's when Elizabeth Stride was murdered in Duckfield Yard, which was just off Commercial Road. So it's a little way away from the other murder sites that had already happened. She had had a throat cut, but she hadn't been mutilated. And what seems to have happened there is a man called Louis Deemschutz had come into the yard and found the body. And as he did so, his pony... Sh uh, shined up with alarm. Something startled it. So what probably happened was that he interrupted the killer. So the killer didn't have the chance to carry out the mutilations. But then 45 minutes later, another body, that of Catherine Edwards, was found in Mitre Square. And she had been horrifically mutilated. She'd been cut open, V's cut into the cheeks, V's into the eyelid. And he'd taken away the uterus and the left kidney and gone off with the uterus and the left kidney. And then there's another gap. The whole of October went by, no more murders. But the thing that did happen in October was the police had been given a letter at the end of September that was signed Jack the Ripper. And they made that letter public, hoping that it would be able to bring them close to catching the killer. Massive mistake. Not only was it uh, later believed that the letter didn't come from the killer, it started off a pastime in England. People started re reaching for their pens. And the police were deluged with an, aval an avalanche of uh, 
check the little correspondence, all sorts of things. I'll be here on Thursday. Come and catch me if you can. Uh, all, all sorts of and many of them signed Jack the Ripper. So now the police weren't just continuing this investigation. They had all these hoax letters to contend with and everyone had to be read and assessed because obviously it, one of them might have come from the killer. So uh, the whole of October goes back and the police are doing this. They've also increased the detectives in the area as well. That might have been another reason why October goes by, no killings. Early November, people think, well, that's it, it's finished. And then on the 9th of November, a lady called Mary Kelly was murdered in her room at 13 Millers Court in Dorset Street. And she had been horrifically mutilated. This was the one that was photographed at the scene of the crime. She's the only victim photographed at the scene of the crime. And if you look at that photograph, you can just see, well, first of all, you, you have to really look to see that it's a person. That's how bad the mutilations were. And in fact, that, that photograph, uh, strangely enough, is probably one of the earliest crime scene photographs we have. Uh, it's certainly one of the first in London. And there might have been a few earlier, but this is the one we still have. And it was an horrific killing. And then just as mysteriously as the murder started, if we believe she was the last victim, the killing stopped. And that's left us now wondering who was Jack the Ripper. And for over 130 years now, people have been trying to find Jack the Ripper. And hardly a year, hardly a month goes by where someone isn't on an internet forum, or publishing a book or contacting newspapers to say, I've caught Jack the Ripper, I've solved the mystery. And then that's in the newspapers for a few weeks. And then the next person finds Jack the Ripper and it just continues. And so it continues to snowball. But it's just got this way of gripping people. And once people get into it, they really do, A, they get into the mystery, but B, they get into the history of it as well. So in a nutshell, that's the Jack the Ripper crimes. OK, well, uh, let's look at the backdrop. This is uh, 1888, the east end of London, Whitechapel section. Um, and this is a poor area. This is an impoverished area filled with an influx, as you mentioned, of immigrants uh, seeking to escape situations in their home countries, uh, whether they be Jewish, Eastern Europeans. We had Irish immigrants. You had all sorts of people mixing in that area and a lot of poverty, a lot of women forced into prostitution. And I believe a good percentage of, if not all, these known victims were believed to be uh, prostitutes. And I think it really set the stage for how we view serial killers. They go after the undercurrent of society. They go after the underbelly, those who are least likely to be missed or uh, widely documented their demise. Uh, at least that's what I see. Um, but each of these killings, there's, there's a shroud of, of, of thought around a number of other killings that took place in the, in the East End of London at this time. Is that correct? There is indeed, yeah. Uh, that's why I was hesitant about saying there were five victims and it was 1888. Right. Because the actual Whitechapel murders go from April 1888 to February 1892, and there are 11 victims in the Whitechapel murders. There's also a sequence of murders called the Thames Torso murders that are happening around the same time as well, where torsos of women appear in the River Thames and around the banks of the River Thames. Right. So this is, this is unusual for the Metropolitan Police in London. They had not seen this level of barbarity with regards to domestic homicides like this before. Is that correct? That's very correct, yeah. In fact, uh, the big problem they had was that the killer wasn't leaving any clues behind. Uh, Robert Anderson, who was the assistant commissioner at the time, uh, he was the head of the Criminal Investigation Department, the CID. He actually went on record. He said, for one murder to occur where the killer doesn't leave a clue behind is unusual. But for a whole series to happen where no clues are left behind is unheard of. But that's the problem the police had. They had nothing to go on. And of course, they didn't have the modern forensics that we have today. Even fingerprinting wasn't an stat. It was around, but it wasn't used by the police. And they looked for footprints. They would search the scenes and look for footprints if there's any distinguishing footprints. Fingerprinting, forensics, they were unheard of. So it was all they could do was do what they did, flood the area with police officers and just hope the next time he struck, there'll be a policeman on hand to, ca to catch him. But it never happened, and that's why he got away. Well, wow. was there a point in time through your research in, in, in with the police department, was there a point in time that they came to the conclusion, what we would consider today as a serial killer, that all of these, at what point did they put all of these together and, and have it be responsible, the responsibility of one person? 
it's a, it's a bit of a strange one that because uh, officially it happened just before Mary Kelly was murdered. Dr. Robert Anderson, who I've already mentioned, the the assistant police commissioner, he sent reports of four of the previous uh, four victims. Uh, so the four victims were Mary Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, and Catherine Eddowes. And he, uh, early November, he sends those to Dr. Thomas Bond, who was the divisional police surgeon attached to Scotland Yard, or had been. And he asked Bond's opinion, and Bond wrote back uh, to or started preparing a report. But before he sent the report back, the murder of Mary Kelly happened in Miller's court. And Bond was asked to go and con uh, conduct a post-mortem on the body. So he went and then he said, I have now looked at uh, the reports. and I've also continued or carried out a post-mortem on a woman found in Miller's court uh, yesterday. And I'm convinced they were all by the same hand. So that's the first mention we get that these five victims are killed by the same person. What's interesting, though, is that he wasn't asked the comment on previous two victims, Martha Tabram, who was murdered on the 7th of August, and Emma Smith, who was murdered in early April. He was only sent the reports for the for, from Mary Nichols onwards, which would appear the police were starting to already have the opinion that these that those murders were related, whereas the other ones weren't. And it's also interesting, it's often said that Thomas Bond believed there were five victims, but a year later in July 1889, a lady called uh, Alice McKenzie was murdered, and she's a, a Whitechapel murders victim. He was actually asked to uh, consult on her, and he said that he was convinced she was a victim of the same person who carried out the previous murders. So although it's often said that Bond believed there were five victims, and that's what we now call the canonical five victims, if you'd taken what he said about Alice McKenzie, he believed there were six victims. So the, the MO being um, significant knife traumas, multiple knife wounds to the neck, abdomen, and other areas of the body, uh, specifically the sex organs, uh, removing organs on at least one. Is it true that there was a, um, a human body organ that was actually sent to the police along with a letter? It, it is. Uh, I, what, 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 happened, what, what happened with that was when Catherine Edwards, Catherine Edwards was murdered on the 30th of September, the killer had cut out and gone off with her uterus and left kidney. Now, throughout early October, the vigilance patrols in Whitechapel, and these, were, these are often portrayed in films as being vigilantes, but they weren't. They were vigilants. And the idea was they would go out and supplement the police and they would keep suspicious looking characters under surveillance and then report them to the nearest police officer. So they were out in force. And one of the big things they had was that no reward was being offered. Uh, George Lusk, who was the president of the Whitechapel Mile End Vigilance Committee, he was forever writing to the police, the Home Secretary. One stage he wrote to Queen Victoria in early October saying, we must have a reward. And every time it was rejected. But because of that, he'd been in the newspapers an awful lot. And one of the threats that was made in several of the Jack the Ripper letters in early October was that he would take out a body part and eat the, the ca cannibalism kept being mentioned in several letters. And on the 16th of October, Mr. George Lux sat down to his dinner table and he got a letter, well, he got a package actually in the evening mail and he opened it and inside was a letter. This is the famous From Hell letter, which became the subject of the Johnny, well, first of all, the graphic novel and then the Johnny Depp film From Hell. That's where that title comes from. And that letter said, Mr. Lusk, sir, oh, sorry, Mr. Lusk, sir, I sent ye half a kidney I took from one woman, preserved it for ye, t'other piece I fried and ate, t'was very nice. I may send you the bloody nip that took it out, if you only wait a will longer, sign, catch me when you can, Mr. Lusk. And wrapped inside that letter was half a human kidney. Uh, and that's been the subject of intense debate ever since. Did it come from the killer? And was that kidney part of Catherine Eddowes' missing kidney? And at that time, impossible to tell. No DNA, uh, no real forensics to, to tell whether or not that was actually from that victim. But there's yeah. been so much speculation that based upon the, uh, the surgical, we'll call it, ability to remove organs and to the, the mutilations appeared to be more than just rantings of, of the psycho. They appeared to be... Uh, surgical in nature, if I can use that word, overuse it. 
were doctors at the time and surgeons looked at by by uh, Scotland Yard as potentially being involved? Were who were suspected? Who was who were suspects at the time? If I can ask. Anyone and anybody. <laughs> they were. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, it was used by a lot of people to get to level scores. So a lot of people would sort of uh, write and say, oh, it's him, it's him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you had a lot of one of the big problems they had as well was a lot of people were out on the streets as amateur detectives. Uh, everybody could, took an interest in it. So you had a lot of amateur, to, and ma many of those were quite strange to 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 be kind to them. Strange is perhaps <laughs> kind of They were always getting arrested and hauled into the police station. Several doctors among them. One thing we do know is that the police were suspicious of medical students, and we do know they were actually checking into the backgrounds of several medical students, several of whom had been in asylums and had been released lately. Uh, Sadly, we don't know who they were, but we know that they, they were looking into medical students. We also know that uh, the, 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 the police were sort of looking at uh, very early on, uh, well, not the police, sorry, the coroner very early on in Annie Chapman's murder. He raised the, the possibility that she'd been killed so that the killer could acquire her womb. Uh, and this had come from Dr. George Baxter Phillips, who was the police surgeon who'd inspected the body at the scene of the crime, crime in the backyard of Hanbury Street. And he said in his inquest testimony, he said that uh, the fact the killer had cut out and gone off with her womb suggested to him that the reason for the murder had been that specific, uh, so he could acquire that specific part of her anatomy. Furthermore, he said, the skill with which he did it and the speed with which he did it suggested to him the killer possessed some anatomical knowledge. Uh, and that was picked up by the coroner, who then said, yeah, well, it, you know, it's obviously there's anatomical knowledge being shown. And this grabbed people's attention because the idea now was the killings were being carried out by maybe a doctor who wanted the wounds for medical research purposes. Uh, and, and so that gave it a whole new uh, impetus. But the interesting thing is that doctors at the time wore top hats and carried their instruments in a black bag. And that's where we get our image of Jack the Ripper from, wearing the top hat, carrying the bag. Uh, and that, that's where it came from that. So they were suspicious of doctors. They were suspicious of, uh, suspicious of butchers, of slaughtermen, just anybody who uh, they could be suspicious of, they were suspicious of. And everyone they pulled in, nothing stuck. They had alibis or they were excused. And so consequently, the murderer got away with it. Wow. I mean, it's so it's so fascinating and so incredible to just hear about, you know, this because there's so many aspects of the investigation and the case that aren't known. You don't know about it. And you shedding light on so many things is so intriguing. It's, it's amazing. The one thing I want to ask uh, is on your tour, you pay a lot of attention to the victims. And I think you made it a point that you wanted to do that on your, you know, during your tour. So what was the commonality? What were, what were the victims? Tell, let's talk about the, these young women uh, for a little while and see, you know, their background and, and maybe why they were, they were targeted the way they were during that time frame. Yeah, I mean, the victims, uh, the majority of them weren't, weren't young women. They were sort of in their late 30s, early 40s. Uh, the youngest was Mary Kelly, who was 25 years old. But the women were, they all followed a pattern. They were all, they were all alcoholics. Uh, they, and in those days, there was no welfare. There was nothing that caught you. If you slipped through the net, that was it. Uh, you ended up either on the streets or, in most of the cases, in the common lodging houses in the East End of London. So they all had fairly, I, I wouldn't say wealthy backgrounds, but they certainly weren't poverty-stricken backgrounds. They'd been married. They had children. and then. Alcohol became their downfall. They slipped through the net and ended up in the East End of London. Now, there's a bit of a debate today as to whether or not they were prostitutes. There's a, a, a big movement saying that everyone's got it wrong. The police were misogynist, misogynistic police officers just automatically presumed because they were out on the street at two in the morning. Uh, they were prostitutes. Uh, personally, I, I don't like the word prostitute being used for them. Uh, I prefer the Victorian term, which was unfortunate, because I do believe they dabbled in casual prostitution as a means to survive, because these women had to survive. They had to have the money for a lodging. They had to have the money for food. So consequently, they're out in the streets. And 
but so and the argument goes on were they weren't they prostitutes personally i believe they were uh, and what would happen is they would uh, for example mary nichols and annie chapman they were staying in lodge, uh, common lodging houses and you paid four pence for a single bed eight pence for a double bed and that money was collected late in the evening around about 11 o'clock to midnight and if you didn't have the four pence for your bed you were ejected you were out on the street for the night and that happened to both of them they didn't have the money they were sent out onto the street we know mary kelly was seen at 2 30 in the morning so this is an hour and 10 minutes before her body was found by she was seen by a friend of hers called ellen holland and she was very drunk and she boasted to evan that she'd made the money several times over uh, for her for her bed and she'd spent it on alcohol and ellen was a bit concerned she said look come and sit in the kitchen and mary's response was no I'll get the dust money and see they keep my bed. And she staggered off down Whitechapel Road and somewhere between there, uh, along there, she met the killer who would kill her. He wasn't called Jack the Ripper at the time. We didn't have that name at the time, but she met her murderer at some stage after that. So that's a pattern. They were alcoholics. They were drunk. They were surviving. They were trying desperately to survive in an environment where there was nothing to, to catch them. If they fell through that net, they couldn't survive. Right, the no interesting question. thing about them was, uh, in most cases, they were murdered in the streets, in quiet back streets. So what's interesting is it would, and this is a case that one of the detectives on the case, uh, Henry Moore made, he said that, um, it, it, well, words to the effect of, that it's the women who are choosing the murder sites because they know by, by what they do, they know the places to take him to where they're not going to be interrupted. And so inadvertently, they chose the perfect place for their murders. And by the time they realized anything was wrong, it was too late uh, because they were in quiet back streets. There's no police around. There's nobody to save them. Uh, and so that, that's what was happening. So it's that common pattern. They were probably prostitutes desperate for money. And they're, they're from the, I, I don't want to use the word lower stratum, but they are certainly unfortunates on the streets of London. And they just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Do you, you know, with with what you just said, raised a, a very uh, big question I wanted to ask you. Uh, was there a theory, or do you believe, was Jack the Ripper a customer? And, you know, or were they just either on their way home or leaving their house when they were when they were murdered? Or... Is there a theory that there was a conversation with him as a potential customer brought to a location like you had said, the women knew, and that's where the murders took place? This is a really interesting point because um, I mean, the obvious answer to that is we don't know because we, do, yeah. we don't know what happened at those places. But certainly with the later murders, because pa everyone's panic stricken now, and we do have records of women are keeping off the streets in the aftermath of the murders. So they are certainly more wary uh, from September onwards uh, of, of who they go with, but they quickly forget because obviously they're desperate for the money. So they're, uh, and they're drunk, so their guard is down uh, when they go with him. So what I think is that he, he, he was, I, I don't think he was a customer per se in that he was going to follow through, that, that the act was going to take place. Right. What I believe is that he posed as a customer because as far as the doctors were aware that they, they did this and well there's several cases the doctors say there's no evidence sexual intercourse has recently taken place so consequently uh, I, I personally believe that uh, and again i hate to use this i hate to describe him thus but he has to have been charming because at the height of the panic these women didn't feel threatened by him and they went with him into the uh, back streets and they went to the places where they knew there was no protection for them and that could only have happened if they trusted their killer. Seems to be a common theme in serial killer cases. Um, uh, they're con men. The ability to create uh, a calming sense, a reassuring case uh, sense among people, among victims, so that they will listen to you and do what you need them to do. Ted Bundy was charming. I mean, some of these people are absolutely, you know, brilliant. They're sociopathic. And they, as a result, they have the ability to manipulate. And they manipulated emotions at a time when fear was at its height. So the newspapers at the time, in America, we had a lot of yellow journalism, they called it, right? Sensationalism and stuff, I'm sure. Uh, London was not immune from that. Um, but was there a public outcry? Uh, and was there an official 
outcry uh, demanding that arrests be made in this case? Was there any, how much pressure was on Scotland Yard? And what did that- A huge amount. They, they, they were under massive pressure, pressure to do. They were getting an awful lot of press criticism, not just for the Jack the Ripper murders. Uh, this had been going on for a couple of years. The Metropolitan Police Commissioner was a man named Sir Charles Warren. And Sir Charles Warren was a very authoritarian figure. What's interesting about the commissioners at the time was none of them had come up through the ranks. They weren't experienced police officers. It's only the lower ranks that are, have got experience. So some of the detectives are, are working in CID have got police experience, but the higher echelons haven't. They come from the military or they come from the civil service. And Sir Charles Warren was an army man and he was brought in to bring much needed discipline to the police force. But he took his job very seriously. And at the time, the homeless were protesting a lot in Trafalgar Square. It was a famous occasion the year before, on November the 13th, which was a Sunday, uh, 1887. There was going to be a protest rally in uh, Trafalgar Square. And the Social Democrat Federation had actually challenged it. So we're going to hold a meeting. So Warren got all the mounted officers, all the police ready. And it was carnage. Uh, it became known as Bloody Sunday because uh, and there were so many charges of police brutality uh, the, the, on, on that. Uh, and it made Warren incredibly unpopular. Uh, and then several things that happened. With, he, he was very loyal to his rank and file. So he was actually loyal to his officers and he would back them to the hilt. And that backfired on him because he did it several times. He did it in J June 1887, for example. A girl called Miss Maria Cass had been uh, uh, arrested on Regent Street by Police Constable Endicott. And uh, he accused her of being a prostitute. Uh, basically, he said no decent woman will be seen out at 10 o'clock at night in a <laughs> prostitute. Now, that really did rile people. Uh, and questions were asked in Parliament. The Liberal Party got involved with it. News radical newspapers got involved. Warren backed Endicott to the hilt until Endicott ended up being charged with perjury because it turned out that uh, he, he had actually wow. uh, told a few whoppers about it. But Warren backed him, and he did that all the time with his officers. Uh, he backed his officers on Bloody Sunday, and this made him really unpopular with the radical pre uh, press, the radical papers. So they were just looking for an opportunity to have a go at Sir Charles Warren. And of course, when the Jack the Ripper murder started and the police just couldn't catch him, that was the ideal opportunity. So the murders were jumped on by the radical press to point out the inefficiency of the police force. Some criticism was justified, a lot of it wasn't justified. The police were doing what they could. But the important thing is that the press, or the radical press at least, they weren't picking on the rank and file. Well, they were, but in fact, their target was actually Sir Charles Warren himself. Wow, fascinating times, fascinating times. So. A lot of names through history, there's a lot of armchair detectives who now think they know. I'm sure books have been written about who is the actual Jack, who was the actual Jack the Ripper. Um, tell us about some of those theories and some of those people who have been floated about as being potentially Jack the Ripper. Well, they, they, the, the, the suspects vary from the absolutely ridiculous uh, right to, to a, lo a lot of potential suspects. I mean, at the time, there was one theory, even in the newspapers at the time, that it was an escaped orangutan that, uh, that was carrying out the murders. Uh, so that, and that, that was considered quite seriously uh, at the time. There's also a few, there's a, uh, an American, uh, I, I want to say circus, but it, like a Wild West show, was actually doing the touring around as well. And uh, they brought sort of um, Native Americans or uh, Indians, or, uh, as they were known, Red Indians as they were known at the time. They brought them into this. Uh, and of course, they were like, oh, maybe it's one of them. Uh, Richard Mansfield, the uh, American actor, was performing Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde at the Lyceum Theatre. And he was doing that change every night on stage. And people thought, well, if he can do that, well, he's probably capable of the murders. So th th these are people being suggested at the time. Since then, an awful lot of people have had their names put forward. Uh, everyone from Lewis Carroll, the adventures of uh, the author of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass, uh, but some quite interesting ones as well. There's a chap called Dr. Francis Tumblety, who is an American quack doctor, who was certainly in London at the time, and he's the only suspect who actually got arrested at the time in connection with the Whitechapel murders. Uh, and we know that because he was arrested, he was given bail, and then he skipped bail and went back to America. 
And when he was in America, he was under surveillance by NYPD because Scotland Yard had contacted uh, Inspector Tom, I think it was Thomas Burns, but Inspector Burns anyway, of, uh, of, of NYPD. And he had him under surveillance and uh, they, they were, the journalists knew that he was under surveillance. And they went to Burns and they said, uh, are you going to arrest him for the Whitechapel murders? Because it, well, it was well known in America that he'd been on suspicion of other murders. And Burns' comment was, uh, no, he said, uh, the offence he's wanted for, he, well, effectively, it's not extraditable, so they can't send him back, which suggests it wasn't murder. Uh, probably he, he, was, he was charged with gross acts of indecency with other men. Uh, that's probably what he was wanted for, which wasn't extraditable at the time. Uh, so Tumblety is interesting, though, because we know he was arrested initially for the Whitechapel or on suspicion of the Whitechapel murders. And we know that on his own confession, because when he got to America, he couldn't stop talking about it. And he gave interviews to newspapers, to journalists, saying, well, and he made a very good point, actually, whether you believe him or not, whether he was the Ripper. He said, uh, what does it prove? I got arrested for it. But it's all it was, was I was in London. I went down to Whitechapel, as everybody did, as lots of Americans did. And everybody thought he was an American. So I got arrested. Uh, so that's what he said. And it was probably from that arrest that then they found out about the other things that have been going on. And that's probably why he decided it was best to skip bail. So he's an interesting one, Doc, Dr. Francis Tumblety. There's another one, a chap called Aaron Kosminski, who's probably the best known suspect of recent years, certainly the most popular. Uh, he was um, a Polish Jewish immigrant who lived in Whitechapel at the time. Uh, and he's hinted at by Dr. Robert Anderson in his memoirs, who said that the killer was a low-born Polish Jew living in the heart of the area. Anderson also says there was witness identification, but the witness wouldn't testify. But he stops there. But a copy of Anderson's memoirs ended up with Chief Inspector Swanson. Now, Chief Inspector Swanson is a name. He doesn't get banded. Nobody wants to play him in a film. He's he. He was a desk detective. <laughs> he's not, he's not, he wasn't out there. But he probably knew more than anyone else about the case because he was the man who, in early September, Sir Charles Warren put in charge of reading and assessing all the information that was coming in. So he knew the big picture. And in his copy of Anderson's memoirs, he pencils in the margin Kosminski. So their suspect was Kosminski. And a, a researcher who sadly died a few years ago, but his name was Martin Fido. He traced the Kosminski in the asylum records and found Aaron Kosminski. And he's the only one in the asylum that fits the dates and fits the description that Swanson and Anderson give. Uh, the only problem is that he doesn't, he's, he's not homicidal in, in the asylum. We, we don't know that much about him personally, but the worst thing he does in the asylum is he throws a chair at one of the attendants. That's the level of his violence in the, when he's in the asylum. So, there's a possible, and the other thing I should say is he lived to March 1919, and Swanson says that this Kosminski, who he had in mind, died shortly after going into the asylum. So the problem now is that we know that the suspect's name was Kosminski, but the Aaron Kosminski that's been put forward doesn't fit with what with what Swanson says, and doesn't fit with the idea of a homicidal um, uh, murderer. So consequently. Either he wasn't the killer or we've got the wrong Kosminski. So, uh, so it's all we really know is their main suspect was named Kosminski. But since then, everyone says it's Aaron Kosminski. Uh, so he's another name that's been put forward. Queen Victoria's grandson, uh, Prince Albert Edward Victor, who died in the flu pandemic in um, 1891. He's been put forward as a suspect. Uh, and he's in it in several ways. One is he carried out the murders himself. The other is that he married a Catholic girl named Annie Elizabeth Crook. Uh, she, they had a child together, which posed a direct threat to the, uh, the, the Protestant line because uh, she was a Catholic. Uh, the, uh, the Freemasons were sent out to silence, uh, to, to, to break the family up. Annie Elizabeth Crook was put into an asylum. They tried to get to the child, but the child was smuggled to safety by the servant girl whose name was Mary Kelly. And she went into the East End of London. She got to know some of the prosti other prostitutes around there and told them what she knew. And they started blackmailing the royal family. So then the Freemasons went out and they murdered them to silence them. Uh, it's a very far-fetched theory, wow. <laughs> but uh, it, it, it's perhaps one of the best known theories, actually. Uh, there's a book published in the 1970s called The Final Solution by Stephen Knight. Uh, and that's all about the royal theory. It's, uh, it's, it's an interesting. 
I'll, I'll say it's an interesting book and leave it at that. So who do you think did it? You're, <laughs> you're the guy. I mean, you, you know, hey, that, suspect, yeah. really, that, you know, that's, uh, you know, a lot of the information you have. I mean, what you can rattle off the top of your head is mind blowing, first yeah. of all. <laughs> you know, as an impressive as I've ever heard someone talk about a case. I mean, I've run it's, cases and I'm don't know my cases the way you just said, you know, you're running <laughs> names. Uh, so what's your theory? What do you think? My theory, my theory I, I think that the one we have to look at the most is Aaron Kosminski because of what Swanson and Anderson both seem to say about him. Although there is another suspect who I think is really worth looking at, and that's a man called Thomas Cutbush. Now, he goes into an asylum the same time as Aaron Kosminski, and Cutbush is, is very violent in the asylum. He, 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 put, put, he picks up knives, threatens to rip people apart. One occasion, his mother and auntie go to see him. His mother goes to kiss him goodbye, and he tries to bite her nose off. Uh, so he's he, he's and he and he lives right up till 1909. So he's actually d does does fit in. Uh, I don't think he's Swanson's suspect, but I think uh, he was arrested uh, in 1891 for stabbing girls in the bottom uh, in 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 Kennington in in South London. But then for some reason, in 1894, the Sun newspaper began doing a series of articles where they said that they knew who Jack the Ripper was and they'd been to see him in Broadmoor. And they did, it was like for five days, they did articles about this, this man who they would visited in Broadmoor, who was Jack the Ripper. They don't name him, but from everything they say, it's Thomas Cutbush. Uh, there's, there's no doubt about it. So he's interesting because his files, uh, Aaron Kosminski's files haven't been made public yet. Uh, Thomas Cutbush's have, and I saw them in nineteen, sort of in nineteen hundred nine, in two thousand and nine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing well for my age. I'm doing well for my age. Yes, and I saw them in two thousand and nine, uh, and he, he, he really does fit in. I think he should be looked into more. But my personal opinion about who did it is, we'll never know. I think it was <laughs> someone in the area who everybody thought he's a bit odd. He's a bit odd, but he's harmless. And then every so often, the voices in his head got too much and he went out and carried out the murders. And I think that's that's the case with all serial killers. They're personified on uh, CSI and on uh, uh, all the detec the, uh, detective shows as being clever people, as being geniuses. Uh, yet off often they're just banal people. And uh, often it's when they get caught, it's their own stupidity that gets them caught. Right. They become they become emboldened by getting away with it for so long. Yeah. Um, and some of them actually want to be caught because they want the um, they want the fame, the infamy. It's it's yeah. something in a life of nothing usually. We've well to overly generalize. You know, there's been there's been a lot of speculation, and um, I don't know that it's gone anywhere. But the popularity of Eric Larson's book, The Devil in the White City in Chicago, brought attention to the uh, Doctor H. H. Holmes. At least that's one of yeah. his names who was responsible as a local serial killer during the 19, 1893 World's Fair in Chicago. And um, I think there's even probably a movie version of that book. It's an excellent book. Uh, do you think there is any plausibility to a connection between that gentleman and, and these killings? I, I was involved the other year with, um, I've just forgotten his name, actually. It's, uh, uh, it's Jeff, is it Jeff Mudger. Uh, his, his, great, his great grandson or great, great grandson we did a thing on, I, I was involved in a program on the Discovery Channel with him. And uh, that was the big question they wanted to find out was, was H.H. H. Holmes in London at the time of the murders? And we couldn't find any proof of it. Uh, he might have been, he might have come to London. It's possible. But um, personally, I, 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 don't, I don't think he was. I, I, don't, I don't think, uh, I, I think Jack the Ripper was certainly a local man. Uh, or somebody who had not a bit, a bit of knowledge of the area. He was someone in the area. I don't think, I think H.H. H. Holmes is great, uh, but I would just say that uh, I'm, I'm astonished by how many people uh, want their, their their ancestors to have been Jack the Ripper. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. It always astonished me how people will go, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we know it's my great granddad, you know. Well, <laughs> that's the last thing I would want known. Uh, <laughs> Do you think, do you think there'll ever be an answer with, I mean, we uh, forensic genealogy, um, DNA has come so far and will continue to improve. Um, do you know whether or not Scotland Yard has maintained any of the physical evidence from any of these crimes or is that long ago gone? 
It's all long ago gone. This is one of the problems we have. This is why I don't think the mystery will ever be solved, because um, we, we know they had suspects uh, and we know that. But the problem is none of the evidence has survived and any evidence that has survived, such as the uh, any letters or Jack the Ripper letters, it, the DNA has been so it's been passed through so many hands now. The, the, the DNA will be, if it's there, will be completely co uh, contaminated. It just won't be, uh, uh, would, would never be admissible. One interesting thing, and of course, the other thing is that how, how do you get the DNA to link in with his victims? Because the victims were buried in common graves. Uh, so you can either find, maybe find uh, descendants of the victims and use their DNA. I know Patricia Cornwall did uh, uh, get the University of Leicester to uh, to see if, look into the possibility of exhuming Mary Kelly's body uh, uh, in St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Cemetery. And they went, uh, I think she paid, I can't remember how much it was, but she did pay a lot of money to get the investigation done. And they concluded that uh, she couldn't, she'd been buried in a common grave, the grave had been reused. And the problem with an exhumation is that something like that, you don't just have to get the uh, permission of the, re of the relatives or descendants, there's lots of people, if it's a common grave, there's going to be lots of people buried around her and they've got to get permission from every one of their uh, descendants relatives as well. So um, the conclusion was that, um, that no, you can't exhume her. I could have told her that for half the price, but hey. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my you gosh. know, yeah, those are the two. It's funny, Dan, you, you know, read in my mind, great, li great minds think alike. Uh, I was wondering if it was actually still an open case, looking at it as a detective and, you know, and Dan is a detective. So is the case technically still open? And the other question yeah. I had was I, I, I thought a lot about the, the letter that he actually signed Jack the Ripper, if that was ever preserved and, and you would answer that, that. It wasn't, which can imagine that today on the open market. Yeah. Oh, the, the, the Jack the Ripper letter is preserved. It's in the National Archives at Kew. Oh. So you can actually you can actually see the it's the Dear Boss letter, uh, and that's at the National Archives at Kew. So that 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 letter wow. certainly. Wow. But again, that that letter is it's been handled so so many times, uh, uh, and quite a few of the letters that were sent in have been have been preserved as well. The From oh, wow. Hell letter hasn't been preserved. We've got a facsimile of it, but. We haven't got the actual letter itself. Uh, what's interesting about the From Hell letter is that the kidney was sent to Dr. Openshaw at the London Hospital. And uh, he said that uh, he couldn't tell whether it was a female kidney or a male kidney. Is all he could say was that it had been preserved in spirits of alcohol. Uh, and that was then twisted by some of the newspapers to say that it was Catherine's kidney because he said that it was the kidney of someone who was prone to drink. That's not what he said at all. <laughs> he, he said it's been preserved in spirits of alcohol. Uh, but when, when have the newspapers ever, <laughs> ever, <laughs> ever been stopped by a little thing like facts? <laughs> right. Don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. That's, That's uh, it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. This, this case has definitely taken a life of its own. Um, it, it continues to go on, and I can't help but wonder if solving it would almost be anticlimactic and it would probably be a downer. Right? I mean... If we were to actually find out who it was, it would remove the mystery, and we love mysteries, don't we? Well, this is this is it. Uh, I mean, what, what, I mean, one one point about it is that uh, everyone wants to solve it, uh, and you get so many books come out, so many people try and solve it, and so many people claim they have solved it. I mean, like I say, it's a, every year there'll be a, a newspaper report saying, "I've caught Jack the Ripper." The, mis the mystery's been solved. It's the same newspapers. I don't know if they ever look back on previous issues. Say, "Hang on, you caught him last year. <laughs> you, solved, you solved it last year. You solved it three years ago." <laughs> so, uh, I, but uh, I, I, I'm, I'm in two minds about whether because a lot of people say that if we knew who he was, then there'd be no mystery for us. But it isn't just about the mystery. It's, I, I think one of the reasons why it's such a fascinating story for a lot of people is. It's the atmosphere it creates as well, because A, it's far removed from us. So we can actually look into it without feeling voyeuristic because it's history. It's over 130 years ago. So if it was like if it was like a modern murder, I mean, I know people do get obsessed with modern murderers, but I just think you'd have that awkwardness if you were sort of uh, you'd be a bit awkward about it. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of looking into people. Whereas with this, there's no danger of that happening. Uh, there's no danger of, uh, of, of us ever catching anyone anyway, because uh, 
if he's if he's still around, he's going to be a bit do- dodgy. <laughs> but uh, so so I don't think we're going to, we're going to have we're going to not have that aspect. But no, I I think there's so many aspects to it that are still fascinating without the big mystery of who is it. There's the social history, the detective history. There's what's happening with the police, and I think uh, with that, uh, that's still enough to keep to keep it going. I think there's quite a few. Uh, uh, murders in history that have been solved that people are still studying today because they are so fascinating and i think that would fall into that or this would fall into that category yeah i uh well, you know one of the one of the things that uh regards to um, you had brought up is was 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 uh you know one of the things you brought up was law enforcement back then and what took place you know it was the dawn of preserving a crime scene it was interviews. It was, you know, what we call omnipresence, you know, flooding an area with police officers so something doesn't happen. You know, all those started with the, with this back in the day, and it's still done today. Uh, you know, and no one knew, obviously, what it was going to lead to. But the, the forward thinking of the police department back then was fascinating to want to preserve an area and think of it as a crime scene and like you said a photograph even being done of a victim uh and you think about what's what's done today in in criminal investigations it's it's amazing how the correlation from 135 years ago is still done today it, it is it's uh and, and, and the thing is that i'm the police back then are often portrayed as being inept uh, and uh, because they, they can't catch him so uh, but again, that's what we, we still get that today, don't we? We still get modern detectives are portrayed often in films as being outwitted by the serial killer. I mean, I, I, I always think of Criminal Minds. Uh, I, can, I can never remember the episode, but there's one where uh, there's a serial killer who Hodge does battle. He ends up killing, uh, I think he kills Hodge's wife in, in it. In, yeah. but, he's, but they're always portrayed as these really intelligent, super, super people. And, uh, and most of them, most criminals aren't like that. <laughs> most, most criminals are quite stupid people. <laughs> Honestly, uh, what we used to say in the NYPD, and the reason we were able to make so much overtime off arrest was we would say, thank God they're stupid. Because yeah. they, they give themselves up, they leave trails, they they do everything but hand gift wrap themselves sometimes. Um, but then you have the occasional smart one. And uh, one of the, if you're going to do a homicide, <laughs> if you're going to kill somebody or kill a bunch of people, one of the best ways to do it is to do it to people that are not connected to you. It's fairly simple uh, because yeah. homicide is a crime of association. You generally know the person and have a relationship, and it's gone sour for some reason, whether it be business, personal, romantic. Um, so killing strangers, killing street walking, you know, underprivileged or um, people such as, uh, as Jack the Ripper victimized, you have a better chance to get away with it, which is why... We have at any given time in any large country with a significant population, a certain amount of folks who are either transient or semi-transient who are doing these types of crimes. They're, it's it's a human phenomena. Serial killing happens um, in a certain percentage, whatever that small percentage is, of the population. So they're low. it'll always be. But this fascinated the world at a time, I think, when newspaper reach was starting to become um, much more prevalent. Uh, printing press had really come a long way. Newspapers were, and probably at the time in, in London, you can tell us how many newspapers. I know at one point in New York, there were easily a dozen daily newspapers. That's not like today. Yeah, there were far more than there are today. I mean, there's was, there was, there was daily newspapers, evening newspapers. There were also press agencies as well. Uh, and the press agencies were feeding the, because one of the interesting things about studying the newspapers is you start reading a report, say, in a, a Dundee newspaper, or Edinburgh newspaper, uh, and then the same report appears almost word for word in a London newspaper or a, a South West England newspaper. And that's because many of the stories were coming through news agencies who were pu- uh, putting them out onto the wire. What the journalists found very quickly in this was that uh, Jack the Ripper sold newspapers. Uh, and so the news- newspapers gave an awful lot of coverage to the murders as well. And that helped. Well, that did two things. Interestingly enough, it, it, a it made the mur- the crimes famous, but it scared a lot of people. They were never any. He was never any threat to. Uh, he was. He was. Uh, There's a place up in Scotland called Elgin, which is right up in the, the to the north of, in the north of Scotland, and uh, 
there's records of people there uh, going hysterical because they think Jack the Ripper's after them. Uh, and uh, and as, as Robert Anderson, again, the assistant commissioner said, he said, look, this person's only a threat to a small minority of women in a very small part of London. Yet the impact it had on society as a whole was absolutely massive. It, it's not just in England, it's, it's swept across America as well. The Jack the Ripper fear in America. Right. Unbelievable. So, so you've taken... Go ahead. <laughs> You've taken your your you know your fascination with this and your education and, and information is so incredible, and you've made it kind of a couple of projects that you've done. Uh, your books, your tour, which is famous in London. Tell us about what what Richard just has going on. What you do with the books, names of the book, and your tour for sure, which you know I've watched and and listened to is is unbelievable. Yeah, we can't uh, come, we can't wait to go over and take your tour. Honestly. Right. Yep. Yep. So tell us about everything you, you got going on and your, uh, you know, your your books and everything else. Well, uh, I mean, the tour, as I say, I've been doing that for 42 years now this year. Uh-huh. And uh, I, I was a, I was I, I was a I was a little ripperologist when I started. And now I'm, a, <laughs> I'm still I'm still a little ripperologist. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, I. Uh, I started that in 1982. Uh, what was interesting about that was uh, at first it just poodled along. It was just, you know, I might get 15, 20 people. And the big turning point was 1988, the centenary year. Uh, that's when Jack the Ripper took off. And I was suddenly getting 300 people a night on the tour that <laughs> were coming out. Uh, and it was fascinating. But no, I've, I, I, the, the tour, I've, I've always loved doing the tour because you're taking people into the area. And you, we, I started off by going to this wonderful cobbled alleyway called Gunthorpe Street. And the moment you pass through the arch that leads into it, you just feel the 21st century just retreats behind you. And you could almost be back. You're seeing the dark streets. And so that tour, the idea of the tour is to introduce a, the victims, uh, the mystery, and show you the streets where it happened. And what's interesting about it is that, I mean, the area has been developed. Uh, Serial killing isn't something, uh, well, it is part of the heritage industry, but it's not, not sufficient for them to maintain the sites. So consequently, that's all changed. But to actually stand on the sites, you still get this uh, almost almost thrill, almost electric. You just think, well, I'm on the site. And you're hearing about the people. Uh, so the tour's been my, my mainstay. I've done it, as I say, for 42 years. Uh, and... Every tour I still take, I'm still, I still love it. It's, uh, it's not one of those things that uh, I just do it because oh, it's a job and I'm, I'm doing. I, I, I've got the passion. I just got the passion for it. And I just love taking people. And what I do like about it is that it's something now because of the internet. Everybody knows something about it. So it's not a, like if you do a Tower of London tour or a Change of the Guard tour, everyone just stands and listens to you. Everybody wants to talk to you about it, present their theory, argue with you about it, say, no, 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 I, I, I don't think she was a victim of Jack. She was a different. And, and that's fascinating because as a guide, it keeps you on your toes. You're not just trotting out a script. You're actually learning to react and to, and to have the knowledge to be able to know, know what people are talking about. So I've done that. I then got asked by the... Um, uh, I think it was the History Channel. I can't, I can't remember. It was either History or Discovery Channel anyway, in 1999 to do a program called History's Mysteries on Jan the Ripper. Uh, and uh, I did that uh, for a time. And then that got me into other programs. So I've done a lot, lot of TV in England, a lot of TV in America. I've just done one that's going out on, uh, going out next year, actually, uh, in America uh, on uh, on Jack the Ripper. And it's, uh, it's, it, it's 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 quite. I mean, it's, it's it's fascinating that it's one of those things that TV companies never tire of. Uh, and uh, it, somebody once told me that if if you can make a documentary, there's two things that will always get bought: Jack the Ripper and the Titanic. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, because everyone everyone's fascinated by both both mysteries that they they will they will always be uh, uh, heirs to that. But then that led me into writing books. So I got approached by a, a couple of publishers and they said, "Would you do a book on us uh, for us?" So I started writing books on Jack the Ripper, and uh, from from the books came uh, more documentaries. And I now run a YouTube channel on uh, the Jack the Ripper Tours YouTube channel. And I do, I try and put a, a, a documentary about him up every week. But what I like to do is I like to interview people who've got their own suspects as well. 
because I think uh, no matter how bizarre, people get criticised if, if they've got a suspect and they present their suspect, everybody piles in. Oh, that's nonsense. Oh, that's rubbish. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, almost, it's almost a, a, a footballification of, of criminology. Well, it's a, but my belief is that everybody who comes to the table with a suspect brings something new to the table. And I honestly think if, if there is a chance of catching him, it's not going to be experts who catch him. It's going to be the outside person who's done a bit of their own research and spent something that everybody has uh, noted, everybody's been aware of, everybody's seen it, but they've not taken any notice of it. <laughs> and, no, uh, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry, Pete. I was going to say, uh, in direct correlation to that, the American Zodiac killer in California uh, first sent his uh, ciphers. He sent these really elaborate um, letters uh, to the media, and no one could figure out what they were. We had the CIA working on it, the FBI, all sorts of people, and it was cracked. The code was cracked by a school teacher who, ha who happened to like to do puzzles and took a stab at it. So you're right. I think throwing it out to the world and seeing what comes back, uh, Tom and I will tell you the best investigative cases, the hardest ones are best tackled by teams. And if you can expand your team to the whole world, you never know what someone will bring to the table. So I agree with you on that. I think it's fascinating. Yeah, and I, I think the other thing is that uh, there's the, the tends to be a sort of a, a, almost a, a, a superiority you know, that, that that people have, and it it really I, I see it sometimes in forums where on on Facebook where people people come into it really enthusiastic and they will say I think it could be, and then they get torn apart by people. And I'm just, yeah. and then you just think, oh, you know, they, 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 they've had a suspect. Okay, it might, it might not. So that's what I like to do with interviews. I don't, I interview people, but I, I don't, I don't criticize. I, I just, I just want to know what their theories are. And it's interesting. I, I learn so much from talking to people and I might not, I might disagree completely with their theories, but I will always afford them the respect of listening to their theory and letting them put forward their theory without me interrupting and tearing them apart. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, like I said, this has been in the works since July uh, when, when Richard and I first spoke and put it off to now. Uh, and it's just an amazing, amazing story of uh, the serial killer of all time. You know, and Richard, we thank you so, so much for uh being on our show being available and setting you know so much information out there that people are so into uh and are going to eat up this this one's going to be a good one for sure uh so thank you so so much thank you. Uh, for appearing here and we're going to get all your information out on our platforms and everything with you with the tour and with uh a whole ton of other stuff, whatever we can help out with you, we're going to take care of. Uh, so Dan, we did it again, buddy. Uh, we had a guest that blew us away and uh, put the show in a different level on a different uh, plane. And we can't thank Richard enough. Uh, so thank you for that. And for everyone out there, please uh, keep the law enforcement officers and military officers in your prayers. Say hello to them, wave to them on the street, give them a pat on the back when you see them, and never forget them because they do a job that 90% of this country won't do. And they volunteer to do it, and they do it on behalf of a bunch of strangers that they're going out to help. So keep them in your prayers. Our normal plug, youtube.com slash at gold shields, rumble.com slash gold shields. Check our videos out. Hit that subscribe button. It's free. Hit the bell for your notifications of our new shows that are out and up and running and are coming out and everything else, uh, as well as our website, thegoldshieldshow.com. Again, for my partner, Dan Murphy, for an incredible guest, Richard Jones from London, England, this is Tom Smith. Thank you again for tuning into Gold Shields. Stay safe, and we'll see you soon.